Hi, I'm Dr. Chung. We'll talk about high blood pressure, also known as hypertension, and some of the uh, considerations that go into testing for it and then treatment. So hypertension is a major problem in the United States. Well over half the people over the age of 60 probably have hypertension, most of whom don't even know it. And it's the number one cause of morbidity and mortality in the Western world, meaning death and strokes. So it is an uh, epidemic. What is associated with hypertension? Who might have high blood pressure? Well, first of all, anyone age over the age of 60, 65 is at risk. It's a very, very common problem. But what makes it worse? Some of the most common things are obesity, when the weight goes up, blood pressure goes up. Sleep apnea. You guys may know something about this, but if you don't sleep well, meaning you have obstruction of the airway from your tongue that falls back while you sleep, that can make you work harder and make your blood pressure go up. Too much salt intake and too much fluid that goes with that leads to um, high blood pressure. So our diet has thousands and thousands of milligrams of sodium in it. Uh, the recommended dietary sodium intake in the United States is somewhere around two to four milligrams, or thousand milligrams a day, two to four thousand milligrams. One five-way skyline chili has, I think, about six or seven thousand milligrams of sodium. So it's a very major uh, issue with diet, typically around the uh, around the country. And other things, the different conditions that can cause high blood pressure that we won't go into right now. So. <coughs> The goal of treatment is to get your blood pressure to about 120 over 80. You know, the blood pressure has two parts. This is called systolic, and this is called diastolic. As you know, the heart's a pump, so it squeezes blood 70, 80 times a minute. When it squeezes, the blood pressure is registered as 120. When it relaxes, the arteries kind of clamp down like that and your blood pressure stays at about 80, it doesn't go to zero. So your blood pressure is maintained according to heart rate. Squeezes, relaxes, squeezes, relaxes. That's why you have the two components of the blood pressure. Now, as you can imagine, simplistically, if your arteries tend to be tight, if it squeezes in your body, your blood pressure is gonna go up, 130, 140, 150. If your arteries are calcified and stiff, your blood pressure is gonna be high. So there are multiple conditions that have to do with the aorta and arteries throughout your body that can affect the blood pressure. So having said all that, once your blood pressure is measured multiple times to be elevated above goal, what do you do about it? First thing we do is to adjust lifestyle. So exercise, weight loss, low sodium intake. Uh, if you have sleep apnea, try to get that treated. All those things are very, very important and probably the most important thing you can do for blood pressure. Alcohol intake, another major contributor to high blood pressure. So alcohol can do that to you as well. So having said all that, and assuming that patients are able to, to participate in the lifestyle interventions that can impact blood pressure, what can we do with medications? Well, there are lots of things we can do with medications. Um, blood pressure uh, doesn't go up because of one reason. It goes up because of multiple reasons. Many different parts of the uh, body uh, hormonal systems and things like that can make your blood pressure go up. So it stands to reason that treatment isn't aimed at just one drug, but multiple drugs. So broad classes of, uh, of medications that we might use for blood pressure uh, start like this. There is a rough algorithm we would follow. We'll t typically start with this class, then go to the second class, then go to the third class. Let's call this the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone inhibitors big fancy word for blocking hormones and enzymes uh, that make your blood pressure go up by making your arteries squeeze a little harder, making your kidneys retain a little bit of sodium more than usual. So angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor is class number one. This is the oldest group of drugs in this class. Angiotensin is a substance that clamps your arteries, so it makes your blood pressure go up. It also makes your kidneys hold on to sodium, expanding your fluid in your body and makes the blood pressure go up. So the oldest drugs in this category are drugs like K2 
captopril, enalapril. Now the most common uh, uh, drug that we use in this class is lisinopril. So all the prills are typically angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors. Two main things to consider when you take this drug, they're very effective, probably the first drugs we would start. Some patients, about 20%, 10-20% develop a dry, ticklish cough, but not, you know, people don't even really realize it sometimes, they'll just go <coughs> all day long, and it can be uh, because of the drug, that's important. It can make your potassium go up in your body in some patients, so we have to keep an eye on that. The second class of drugs in this um, in this broad category are angiotensin receptor blockers. These angiotensin molecules work by attaching to little receptors on a, on a, a blood vessel and making the arteries constrict. So these um, substances actually block that receptor. So it's basically a cousin of the uh, ACE inhibitors, but it's another drug uh, class that is in that uh, broad category. The most common drugs we use in that category are losartan and uh, valsartan. And there are other drugs in this category that all ended artan, sartan, so candesartan and things like that. So this category of drugs does the exact same thing as this does, except because of its mechanism of action, there is no cough, okay? almost never. So if patients develop a, a cough with this drug, they'll change to this typically. The third class um, of drugs in this category are the aldosterone inhibitors. Aldosterone is another substance that's made by the kidneys that make the arteries clamp down and your kidneys hold on to sodium. So the most common drug we use in this category is called spironolactone. It's a very gentle diuretic as well. It's a water pill, uh, but it actually uh, holds on to potassium, makes your potassium go up as well, and it actually uh, reduces salt retention, so it gets rid of sodium in your, from your body. So this drug actually blocks the effect of this substance which then lowers blood pressure. So most patients will be on one or two of these actually, either this and that or this and that, as they have significant high blood pressure. Well, what's the next class of drugs that uh, might be effective? This is the calcium channel blocker. Well, what does calcium do? If you look at an artery, this is the way an artery is. The way arteries move, and constrict and get smaller and therefore raise blood pressure is often calcium dependent. Calcium ions flux into the muscle of the wall and makes the arteries contract. So if you can block calcium, you may actually be able to produce a relaxation of the arteries. And that's what this does. The most common drug in this category that is used is amlodipine. There are other drugs like verapamil or diltiazem that are in that category, but for blood pressure, this is the main effect, main drug rather. So that's the calcium channel blocker. The next category would be diuretics, commonly known as water pills. So these are the drugs that uh, produce more urine than typical, so it reduces the fluid content of your body. So it has some side effects but it can actually be a very important part of blood pressure treatment because some people's blood pressures are very fluid dependent or volume dependent. In other words, the most common drug we would use would be hydrochlorothiazide. Other drugs, cousins of these are chlorthalidone. So these are the two main diuretics we would use for blood pressure. So we would add this on to the other drugs that we have. And in some patients, this would be the first drug. Um, there are um, instances where African-American patients might respond the best to these drugs versus the others. So depending on the patient, sometimes we'll choose one versus the other. Now, the final category that I want to highlight for you are beta blockers. So beta blockers 
uh, is a large group of drugs. Beta blockers stand for beta receptor antagonists. So beta receptors are the, um, the molecules that reside <coughs> on your arteries wall, again, right here, that take adrenaline or epinephrine. So adrenaline attaches to these receptors, and what happens is these receptors then make the arteries clamp down, constrict, and blood pressure go up. So beta blockers would block these receptors so adrenaline can't get at it. So beta blockers are very effective at slowing down your heart rate and lowering blood pressure. The most common categories of these are things like metoprolol, carvedilol, bisoprolol. So again, there's a theme here. These all lulls, these drugs are typically beta blockers. And there are multiple, multiple other meds, but basically beta blockers are what we would call third and fourth line drugs for high blood pressure because it has a significant number of side effects. It can cause fatigue. It slows down your heart rate so it can make you dizzy. And in some cases, it can make you more short of breath as well. So all these drugs have potential side effects and relationships with other drugs, they interact, so you have to keep an eye on it. But these are the major categories of drugs that I wanted to highlight for you. ACE inhibitors, ARBs, aldosterone inhibitors, calcium channel blockers, and beta blockers. Thank you very much.